All right, so I guess we'll get started. Um, so today we're going to talk about how to engage students into open source. Um, and this comes out of some, you know, relatively straightforward observations. First of all, I'm sure we all know co contributors are pretty key to open source projects. And students generally want to contribute to open source projects. Um, I'm currently in the final year of my undergrad degree, and basically everyone I've spoken to who hears about open source and knows about open source wants to find a way to participate. And so today we've got a panel of people who've done various different ways of engaging students in open source. We're just going to talk about their approaches and what's worked and what hasn't. Um, and basically we're going to look into how we can grow students into contributors. So I'm Callum. I'm currently in the final year of engineering science at the University of Toronto. Uh, I do research into language models for software engineering tasks as well as event-driven and serverless systems. In terms of CNCF stuff, I do um, Knative eventing maintaining. I'm the UX lead in Knative as well as a cloud events contributor and starting in the summer I'll be working as a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, we also have Ali over here. Um, Ali and is a principal software engineer at Red Hat. He's the co-chair for the mentoring working group in CNCF. Um, he actually was a mentee back in 2010 and he's currently a CNCF ambassador. Then we've got Dr. Corey Leong over here, who's a professor at Valencia College, um, where he teaches about cloud computing. He previously worked at companies like Google, Oracle, and IBM. Um, he's a member of the CNCF Higher Ed Working Group, where he's working on things like mentorships and internships for students to become open source contributors. In the middle, we have Leo Lee. He's also at the University of Toronto, where he's finishing up computer engineering. He's also working on Knative eventing and Knative UX. Um, and he co-founded the University of Toronto Open Source Students Club. Um, and he previously worked as the IEEE student branch co-chair at the University of Toronto as well. And then we've got Zainab, who's a UX researcher and course instructor at two different universities in Ontario. There's OCAD University and Algoma University. She has a master's of mechanical engineering from the University of Toronto um, and has worked with Accessibility Services Canada to develop um, recommendations around communication technologies. Uh, in terms of CNCF stuff, she's been an LFX mentor and is one of the UX working group leads. So we have three out of four of the UX working group leads here. Um, so first of all, I'm going to start with Zainab since you're here. Um, so how have you been engaging students into open source? Yeah, so I can start answering this. A lot of, I guess my experience is maybe a bit different because I work a lot with design students. So I focus mainly on non-code contributions. Um, I think what I find helpful is giving students like an incentive. Uh, so for example, like getting a job is a really big incentive. So how can students improve their portfolios? One of the benefits of open source is that uh, whatever code you develop or whatever projects you make, you can transparently share them in your portfolio um, in comparison to work you've done on an internship, right? So definitely like pitching it as how they can benefit their portfolio and what they can learn from open source contributions. Um, I often talk about open source stuff like as part of my lecture content and kind of opportunities and then students that kind of want to learn more approach me and we kind of pull them into the UX working group and we have weekly meetings. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think I alluded a little bit to what you've been doing, Leo, but how have you been engaging students into open source? Um, yeah, thank you, Callum. So at the beginning of this academic year, uh, me, Callum, and some other passionate individuals, we founded a new student club called U University of Toronto's Open Source Students. We're trying to get, uh, uh, gather more students and increase awareness of this uh, open source in the student community. And so we're trying to uh, foster the uh, open source uh, leader in the future by doing the contribution today. So we're operating in a really open source way. We have uh, our own steering committee, and we have three different uh, divisions in our club, software, hardware, and outreach. And each lead of the division will be a part of the steering committee. So I'm, I'm going to focus more on the software division. So in software division, we have two projects that's currently going on. One is Knative, obviously, and one is the Firefox. Um, each, t each project will have one or two project leads that will be responsible for uh, take, uh, Answering the question, providing a mentorship, and connecting the uh, students with uh, with the community. They usually are the uh, maintainer of the projects. And then, at the very beginning of the semester, we gather everybody together and uh, we invite the uh, project leads to give the presentation about their projects. And the students then are being split into the different project groups based on their interest. And then from then from the, from there, uh, Project Lee will take the uh, responsibility starting from there, and the students' contribution journey will start there. Yeah, so that's kind of like an overview of uh, our our new club is due, and I'll pass back to Callum. Thanks, and Ali, how have you been engaging students? Yeah. 
Um, so I have been involved in mentorship programs at CNCF for some time. Also, uh, before CNCF, I was doing some uh, similar work at Red Hat, at JBoss more specifically. So uh, currently what we do at CNCF is we have these mentorship programs. So uh, one is called Linux Foundation Mentorship, so or we call it LFX Mentorship. Uh, and the other one is uh, Google Summer of Code, so we administer or we uh, manage the CNCF side of things. So uh, that is those, these are the things that I do. Uh, and these programs are structured programs, so we, they're not just randomly people asking questions and random people answering them. It's, it's not like them. So these programs are like, that. there are uh, mentees and they're assigned mentors. So there's a one mentee and one-to-one -one relationship. Often we have actually more mentors uh, per mentee. Um, so in this programs, um, since it's structured and uh, you know the, there is some application phase and things like that, so it is um, there is a bit competition. There is a bit um, you know. Um, so the mentees need to prepare a little bit, which is always a good thing for uh, for for you know motivation. So uh, this is basically what we do at CNCF, uh, at Mentoring Working Group. Uh, we also, of course, try to add more mentorship programs, uh, but it's not, not always easy. So currently, we are just with these two programs. Uh, Google Summer of Code, uh, in case anyone is interested, is happening every summer. And LFX Mentorship is happening three times a year. Um, and we have, for example, for LFX, I think we had like 200 mentees or something last year. For Google Summer of Code, uh, there is less uh, seats available. Uh, I think it was 15 people or something, which are good numbers. So these people, they, um, if they continue after the project, they can become a uh, approver, contributor, uh, not contributor, maintainer of the project. So uh, yeah. Thanks. And last but not least, Corey, how have you been engaging students into thanks, open source? Thanks, Callum. Uh, at Valencia, we have three approaches. One, boot, sh boot camps and workshops. Two, cloud mentorships. And three, cloud internships. So for the first approach, uh, what, I, what I do is I connect with enterprises or organizations in the industries and ask them to uh, remotely connect or come in person to our school and hold a, a, a one-day workshop for students. Uh, so for example, a couple of weeks ago we had Jet Brains come in and do a whole day workshop to teach students about PyCharm and how to connect their IDEs to upstream um, Git uh, repositories. And then uh, just recently we had uh, GitHub the manager and edu educator um, for GitHub come in person and do some activities and, and just teach these students how to use Git. Uh, so that's the first approach. The second approach, it, uh, the student mentorships are a little different from what Ali uh, ha had mentioned from the LXF, but it's in the same uh, vein uh, of, of getting students to learn about cloud native. So, Instead of the outreachy or the LXF, students uh, take a course of mine, a seminar course, and what I do is I actually embed the mentorship uh, work within a seminar course. And throughout the semester, they work under a, an industry expert. Um, and while during this uh, semester, they just report what they're working on, what they will be working on, and any kind of blockers that they have. And then at the end, they'll develop a, a video to show what they worked on. Uh, and then the third approach is the uh, internships. And the internships are very similar to the mentorships, but it's a little bit more formal. It has to go through the actual internship office. So there's paperwork, they actually have to apply. And then during their internship, they have to have um, activity sheets filled out showing that they're actually working on their internship project. They have to reflect on what they're working on and also meet with me periodically through the semester. So those are the three approaches that uh, we're actually working on right now, Cal. 
Great. And sticking with you, what would you say are some of the benefits to these approaches? And have there been any disadvantages you've seen? Yeah, so great question. Uh, so the benefits are, right off the bat, their, their, their eyes are wide open to a whole new world. They didn't know that all these projects are available to, to uh, contribute upstream. So it's just a whole new world to them to learn about these things. But at the same time, it's, uh, it's a little daunting. I think there was a presentation earlier, Code Cloud showed the whole um, diagram of all the projects. So there's a paradox of choice now. There are just too many, uh, possibly too many choices out there for them to choose. Uh, and, th and then lastly, the other difficulty is uh, their hardware. I'm, I'm experiencing hardware issues with students because they don't know that they have to have a certain amount of memory, uh, CPU usage, how many how many services are running on laptops. So that's the other sort of uh, bottleneck that I'm hitting right now with uh, disadvantages. Yeah, um, speaking briefly, just since I'm also doing the Open Source Club with Leo, we've also been seeing the hardware issue with some yeah. people. Also just an operating system issue sometimes. Um, coming back to you, Ali, what would you say are some of the benefits to the like structured mentoring program that the CNCF runs? And are there any disadvantages you've seen? So uh, the advantages is, um, or one of the advantages is, um, so these structured programs, they have all uh, stipends. Um, so they pay some money to mentees, so not generally students. So uh, when I say mentees in these programs, by the way, let me uh, kind of explain it a little bit. It doesn't have to be like these people don't have to be students in a university or something. They can be any, uh, the term is called open source beginner, so uh, it can be anyone. Um, anyway, so these people, they get uh, some money after completing the program. This is obviously very motivating for mentees, for students, but I'll also talk about that later. It can be also a disadvantage. Um, so that is like the first thing. Uh, but I mean, that is for motivating the students, but the real part is the real benefit. Most people, most mentees uh, don't really see it at the time is that they work with an industry expert and they have a dedicated industry expert helping them, giving them guidance, telling them how to do things. This is very valuable, I think. And they also build some connections. So uh, Callum in the beginning mentioned that I was a Google Summer of Code mentee in 2010. I still work with my mentor. So we work for Red Hat both and um, uh, he is my team lead currently. Um, so you build this uh, network, this bond that will go on after the program ends. I mean, if the mentee is um, kind of understands the value of this, so uh, uh, the mentor needs to explain, or the program administrators or other people, they need to explain the value of this uh, unique opportunity, actually. Um, so, and obviously these programs, since they have Linux Foundation and Google and other names, in them, they can put the uh, names in the CV, so it looks, it, it's good for finding a job when they graduate. Uh, some of the disadvantages is, um, as I mentioned earlier, stipend is great, but it can also be a disadvantage because whenever the program is done, um, they stop contributing because there's no money coming anymore. Um, so again, the smart ones, smart mentees, they continue because they think that in the long run this will get them a job or even better things. Uh, but yeah, and the other one is uh, the other disadvantage with these programs is, for example, unlike universities or student clubs, these are all remote. So um, it can be hard to have the students or mentees and also mentors motivation up during the programs. Uh, for that, uh, obviously, we, for example, recommend um, meeting, having a meeting, virtual meeting every week, you know, or things like that. So uh, we can maybe talk about them later. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. And uh, moving back to you, Leo, um, what would you say are some of the benefits to the club environment that comes from um, engaging students through a club? And are there any disadvantages you've seen so far in the couple months of running this in a club? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Callum. So regarding the advantages, I think because starting as a student club, it is one of the way that's the 
closest way to the students. Um, it's, it's basically it's the student's daily life, and you got in, in touch with, interact with the student on a daily basis. You meet them in person, and all the uh, events or workshops or meetings are happening in person. So it gives, gives you like a more closer relationship between, that, between you and the students. And also, because it's affiliated with the school, <coughs> you get a lot of exposure to the students. For example, we have club fairs, and we have like uh, many different st other student organizations can help you to repost your, uh, your stories to spread the world, uh, spread the word. Yeah, so, um, and uh, also one more advantage is that um, students are really uh, passionate about it, and if they are really committed, and they will put a lot of effort into the projects and get started to learn. Um, so I would say, Continue, uh, studying uh, as a student club is really good, um, but there are also some dis disadvantages. For example, as, pro uh, as a student, uh, when there are like, some exams or quizzes or tests coming up, I, sometimes the students stress out, and they start ghosting or not completing a task on time, or they just quit. So that is kind of one of the um, biggest pain points that we're facing, is trying to provide the motivation for students to stick around and to um, to find the uh, find a way for them to grow. Um, yes, regarding other disadvantages. Oh, and because there's so many students uh, uh, are interested in the projects, they come together, and that might be like it's kind of hard to find the issues or uh, a ticket to work on in the community. There's like not that many first good issues. Uh, we need to sort that out as well. Um, some tasks are like kind of hard for them to get started, and if they think, oh, this task is so hard to tackle, then I'm just going to give up, not going to do that. So that's kind of the uh, pain points or uh, with this kind of strategies, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Leo. Just piggybacking on that, one other thing I've seen so far is that when a club, sometimes um, someone will help other, like students will help each other in a club environment. And so when we were trying to set up people's builds for Knative, um, one person got pretty far into it, and it was working for them, and then a couple people had problems, and I was helping one of them, and someone else just got helped by a student, and so there was um, not a need as the mentor to always provide that mentorship. There's kind of a community effect you're seeing there. Um, coming back to you, Zainab, what would you say are some of the benefits to engaging with students directly in the lecture, and have you seen any disadvantages from that? Yeah, definitely. So I think one of the main benefits is because I'm like both like their teacher and also like their mentor, I kind of know what skill sets that they have and I think having a one-on-one -on -one connection lets you know what skill sets they want to develop and kind of assign them tasks that way. Uh, so I think the main strategy we've had in the UX working group at Knative is having some this like weekly check-in meeting where you might assign students a project but you really have to break it down into smaller steps and be like, okay, this week you should work on this task, this week you're going to work on that task and then there's that accountability that next week they're going to come back and share, update what they've worked on. Um, so that's uh, one of the benefits of doing it that way. You have the personal connection. Um, I think the second way that we've rec recruited like contributors is through posting the LFX mentorship. And like if you if you post a mentorship, you'll get so, probably so many applicants. Um, so it's good to have other smaller side projects on hand because only one person gets the mentorship. But now your project has exposure and so many other people are interested in your project and want to kind of contribute as well. So I think that's another way that we've recruited. And these are disadvantages as well, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the, the disadvantages of the first method is that you're kind of restricted to kind of like the students that you work with at your own institution. Um, and I think the other, one of the issues with having a weekly synchronous meeting is that people live in different time zones. So some of the contributors uh, that like, live in Asia, they'll have to do their meeting super late at night if we're scheduling it during the middle of the day. So we're still tr struggling to figure out <laughs> that issue, like how we can set a specific time that everybody can meet at. Um, and I think scaling the projects out is a little bit difficult as well, because obviously not everybody is going to be able to come at the same time every week. But I, st I, th I still think having like a weekly check-in and then that way when people are familiar with you, they can at least message you on Slack. So finding ways to make yourself available even outside of the set meeting time um, is beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Anab. I think the weekly check-in is pretty important. I'm pretty sure everyone here mentioned some form of weekly meeting for engaging with students. So um, I, I, I'm pretty confident saying that if you're going to do something with students, you're going to need some kind of weekly check-in to make sure that progress is happening. Um, sticking with you, Zainab, um, how would you say other CNCF projects can participate in your approach of engaging students through the lecture? Or how could other educators replicate your approach? 
Yeah, something that I'm also trying to do going forward is providing course credit or like project credit or like bonus marks because I think like contributing to open source is still like work and there should be some kind of like reward for it, right? Um, so I think if you as a project, is it, are, you're able to find an institute that has like a capstone project and you're able to like break down like a student project into like something that's suitable for like a fourth year capstone maybe, or working with student groups and kind of, you could talk to Leo and Callum and if you have any ideas for projects you want students to work on, you can kind of pitch it to them and we can kind of help you guys simplify things down so that it's suitable for a first is issue for students. Um, did I, 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 yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Um, I guess moving right to Leo then, how would you say that um, CNCF projects can engage, for example, with the existing club at U of T for open source contributions, and do you have any advice on how others can start their own club if they're feeling passionate and are not at the University of Toronto? Yeah, sure. Uh, so first I will try to provide some suggestions from the perspective of the CNCF projects. So last year we actually tried the experiment at two uh, student organizations at U of T, and I was a co-president at IEEE U of T, as Kellen mentioned. Uh, we are the club that's a, like a kind of like a uh, club to do the technical uh, improvement for students, impacting over like 5K students across Ontario and Canada. And Kellen was working at the VP infrastructure for another really huge student organization at U of T. So we're collaborating to make a cloud initiative. Basically, we're trying to gather students to contribute to different CNCF projects like Kubernetes, Prometheus, uh, Knative, and more. And so that's uh, also that's kind of the starting point of we founded this club this year. Uh, so I would say the suggestion is to try to find some really high impact student organizations at the university. So that is a really good starting point for you to get, star uh, get started to in touch with students. Uh, the clubs have resources and they have like a, uh, they have many students, they have a good reputations. So it's really good, uh, it's a good starting point for you to get started. And for the per from the perspective of the students and or professors or faculties, um, uh, I would suggest like to, you can try to start a club like how we do, University of Toronto Open Source Students, trying to mimic the way that we try to do. We have three divisions and try to find the project lead for different uh, projects and uh, have weekly check-in meetings or kind of like an office hour. So if students have any questions, they can come and get a support on time. And um, um, I think, yeah, that's kind of the uh, suggest, suggest, suggestions I have for seeing that project and the uh, faculties, professors, and students. Great, thanks, Leo. And mm -hmm. Ali, if there's any CNCF projects out there who want to participate in the mentoring programs but aren't so far, how can they engage with you? Yeah, so um, reach out to us. That would be the easiest one. So we can definitely guide you. If you are a CNCF project maintainer and you think it's a good idea to mentor people so that you grow your community. So we always, I, I actually talked about the benefits of these programs from the students or mentees perspective, but obviously there are uh, some uh, benefits for communities and also for mentors as well. Um, so anyway, if you would like to uh, have some community growth, if you would like to uh, maybe diversify your community, that's also part of the growth, uh, you can participate in this program and also get some work done, which is always good, you know. There is some research that you would like to maybe do um, as a project, but you never have the time. These programs, it doesn't have to be like, always coding and actually delivering something that the mentee uh, has implemented. It can be also research or, um, for example, with our Knative uh, mentee last term, uh, we did some user research around our uh, website and also some guides if they're useful or not. So, um, I mean, there are details, but um, so definitely reach out to us. If you'd like to learn more about how this program works, um, you can check mentoring.cncf.io. So that goes to our mentoring, CNCF mentoring repository, uh, where we have lots of information. Uh, we also have, uh, before every term starts, we have these um, information set, uh, sessions for potential mentors, for potential mentees. You can also feel free to participate and, and just learn more, ask questions. Um, from the uh, professor's perspective, so um, if you have students who are interested in 
participating in mentorship programs, send them, again, using the same repository. You can find how to reach out, uh, how to contact uh, us, and send them towards our way. Um, yeah. And I have students for you, so they're going to be contacting. Awesome, I guess we'll take it straight over to you. Um, so, but to start with um, Corey, I was wondering how can other CNCF projects engage into your, like you have these with seminar and you have your internships. So if I'm a maintainer of some project or I've got, maybe it's not CNCF, maybe it's just an open source project and I'm looking to get students, how can I reach out to you? Well, I, you have to come find me or I have to come find you. Uh, yeah, that, that's the holy grail. That's what I'm still trying to work on right now is making that connection between uh, maintainers and project team leaders. I do have one wish for the uh, Cloud Native Foundation in regarding to that connection, and, and it's a, small, a short story, short story. Uh, when I came up here this morning, it was snowing out and I didn't really want to walk, but instead of standing in the Uber line, I asked for help to get a, a taxi to come up here, and I asked the concierge to help me. Having an ambassador or some kind of concierge for each group, possibly, that would be great to help me, to help students get to know where to start and how to, and to get started there. So that, that would be my one suggestion uh, for, for projects. Yeah, for sure. And then for other professors who are looking to kind of implement your type of seminar class or anything, do you have any advice or words of wisdom? Uh, yeah, I, I would say... Um, have more open-ended courseware. I, I like to sort of allow my students to work on the, the projects and you know, I treat them, I treat undergraduates as graduates. They're adults, they can make their own decisions. Uh, so uh, I allow them to do their own work during the semester. But if they go ghost, I come find them. So th that's why I, I kind of give them a little tough love there at the beginning. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I allow them the freedom to work on these type of projects. Great, thanks. Um, so that actually wraps up the end of our kind of structured panel, and we still have about eight or nine minutes left on this talk, so we're going to hope to move kind of audience Q&A. And also there's a QR code if you want to give us any feedback on the session, which you can scan, but otherwise we'll just take your questions um, as it goes. And I guess we'll come up to the mic up front, or you can just shout at us and we'll hopefully hear it. Back there, yeah. Um, I can briefly mention as a, like as a student, um, at, at least at the University of Toronto, there are two or three faculty members who do research on open source systems. Um, and so my thesis supervisor is actually one of those three, but I'd say outside of that, a lot of the faculty I've interacted are aware that projects are open source, but don't necessarily engage with the open source aspect of those projects. Um, Zainab or Corey as active faculty members. So I teach at a design university, so not so much. Um, I'm trying to push more for, like again, like capstone projects and like having some kind of open source project as the client. Uh, so I think that's like an easier way if you kind of pitch yourself as a client that has like a real world challenge. Um, and then I think most faculty like want their students to work on real world challenges. So. Um, I think as long as you can, uh, if you're willing to work with the students and like meet with them regularly and kind of provide them your objectives, I think for engineering students, you have to provide very strict, obje like kind of like defined objectives and provide kind of like an expected timeline. Um, and I think also like as working as one of the LFX mentors, having the mentee propose their own timeline, whether it's like a 12 week timeline or a 24 week timeline, just so that they know what they can do and then you know what to expect from them before you sign on to their project. I think that's a good approach, like planning it out before you start, yeah. Thanks, and Corey, any experience at Valencia? Well, I, I found that faculty that have come from industry have a little more awareness of, of cloud technologies and technologies that are out there. So it's a little easier to uh, to coordinate, collaborate with them on uh, cloud technologies. Uh, and then the, the, the faculty that have come straight from you know, gradu graduating, uh, I, uh, the most I've met are mostly interested in learning about 
these technologies. You just have to, you know, just have to help them, help them learn more about them. Yeah. So um, it's not really about interactions, but so for example, we see lots of work trying to be done with ChatGPT in general, and we notice them. Uh, so that's obviously very bad. Um, and also even like mentorship programs, you have to apply. So these students, mentees apply to these programs. Um, we see lots of people just using ChatGPT wildly and sending us the application form. Uh, I mean, it's a general problem, I think. It's not specific to uh, mentorship or any other student uh, mentee or student club problems or professor problems. It's generally affecting every one of us. So you, have, you can use those tools, but you have to use wisely, you know? Yeah, just jumping on what Ali said, um, when I've been looking at applicants for the LFX mentorship program, and like a big part of the application is you're trying to understand how much they understand about the project they're applying to. And so the big challenge comes when they write it with ChatGPT, how much that knowledge was their knowledge and how much the knowledge actually came from ChatGPT. Like I know once I saw um, a proposal that was really great on the content and had typos and grammar mistakes, and I was really happy since I knew for a fact this person actually knew the content. Um, maybe someone's going to go and add grammar mistakes to chat GPT now, <laughs> but Zainab, do you want to add? Yeah, I think kind of echoing the same stuff where we don't really want to see it used to write students' applications, but I think people, like students are very excited about AI applications. Like one of the, uh, like so we had the LFX mentorship I was part of was to implement the website redesign for Knative and someone in their proposal talked about how they'd want to implement like a chat bot. So I thought that was interesting and it would be cool, like those, that kind of stuff is cool to explore where it's like something new and something that they want to work on that could be beneficial to us that isn't just like chat GPT paragraph writing. So I think there's opportunities. It just depends on how it's used. Yeah. Over there. Yeah, I think just to start the answer, then I'll pass it to people here of um, interest. I know that at the University of Toronto, there's actually been a course created that has a project to contribute a PR to an open source project. Um, it's a course on software engineering, and so it's less, it's a fourth year course, so you know how to program at that point, you've learned the fundamentals, it's now how do you actually do software engineering in a team and in the real world, and then they talk about like, what is open source, what are open source practices, and how do you contribute to a project. And so to me, it makes sense to do it at that point in the curriculum since you have all the fundamental skills to make a large contribution. But I agree there's kind of an awareness problem earlier since like a lot of first and second year students could totally contribute to LFX, but they just don't know it exists. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has thoughts on this topic or question. I have, yeah, I have some thoughts. Uh, I think something that's, oh, 
it's kind of loud. Uh, something that's important is having people familiar with the tools to contribute to open source, like version control, for example. Like a lot of, I think students like hear about GitHub, but they maybe don't know what the polite way to engage <laughs> with, with projects through GitHub is, and kind of like, you know, if there, someone opens like an issue, like how to find issues, like kind of like navigating the interface. One of the courses I'm teaching right now, it's like a project course. It's actually a game development course, but I'm having the students um, develop their like software and like using GitHub to manage it. And I'm kind of adding requirements that I'm like, okay, every time you commit something, you have to document it properly. You should all have your own branch, you know? So kind of setting requirements to get them into the habit of using the tools that are industry standard. I think that's a good way. Uh, that's, yeah, that's how I'm trying to approach that. Yeah, speaking about Git, um, for the student club at U of T, we've also had to add like a workshop at the very start for everyone just about um, especially with working with forks um, is a thing you do a lot in open source, but um, if you're learning Git for like your student labs in first or second year, there's not really a fork involved. It's just you're telling you like to clone the starter repo and make a commit. Um, and so explaining that to students is definitely a knowledge gap out there in a lot of university educations. Um, I think that's actually the end of the time we have for this talk. So thank you everyone um, for coming and uh, we'll see you around.